In this chapter, we're going to be going over some of the laws and things that go along with making sure that you're providing uh, equal employment and a safe environment as far as uh, human resources is concerned. Um, now, when you think about the regulations that are necessary, this is primarily at a federal level. So you're talking about the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of the federal government that provide a lot of the laws that we're going to be talking about. There are other there are other laws that may come into play based on the state or even the city or county. What we're going to be doing is primarily focusing in on federal laws at this point. We have a particular concept here in the United States called equal employment opportunity. What that means is that everyone should have an opportunity to to apply and to obtain a job based on whatever based on any kind of of, of qualities that they may have, race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, veteran des, uh, status, disability. So any of those things, making a hiring decision is illegal. You can make different hiring decisions. I mean, discrimination happens all the time. Discrimination only means to choose one over another. You just cannot do that based on, based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, veteran status, disability, you just can't do it. And so the federal government has quite a bit of, of skin in the game, so to speak, as far as making sure that these things don't happen. It all started with some of the amendments that, that uh, took place after the Civil War, the 13th and the 14th Amendment. And then you also had the Civil Rights Acts of 1866 and 1871, again, making sure that people are being treated fairly, no matter what race, color they are. A lot of the key laws actually started in 1963 with the Equal Pay Act basically saying that men and women doing the same job with the same qualifications, the same skills, everything should be paid equally. Now, this is not comparable worth. This is equal worth. So in other words, just because two people, men and women, uh, a man and a woman are being paid differently and they have completely different jobs doesn't mean that the woman should be paid as much or more than the man or vice versa. So same job, same skills, uh, same responsibility, same conditions, you get the same pay. Then you had the biggie, the Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Title VII basically said that you cannot discriminate or you cannot hire or fire based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin. If you have 15 employees or more, it falls under that. Less than that, it, there's still some questions that go along with it. Age was added, all right? So in other words, race, color, religion, sex, and national origin, age was added with the Age Discrimination and Employee Act. So if you, someone is over the age of 40, you cannot choose not to hire them based on their age. Then you had, uh, you started to get into the disability aspect with the Vocational Rehab Act of 73, which was beefed up with the Americans with Disability Act of 1990 basically saying that you cannot discriminate against someone, you cannot choose not to hire or to fire someone based on their disability if they can do the job with, uh, with reasonable accommodations. Now, the key here is reasonable accommodations. In other words, you have someone who, um, who has, who's in a wheelchair, all right? You need to make sure that they have access to the workplace and they can do the job, things like that. Then you started to get into the veterans aspect with the Vietnam Veterans uh, Readjustment Act, saying you cannot discriminate against someone if they are a veteran, all right? That also came about and was beefed up with the Universal Uniform Civil Rights Act, Services Rights Act, where it, if you are a veteran, you cannot be discriminated against because you served or uh, because you had to leave to uh, serve the military. Yeah, the Civil Rights Act of 1991, which is basically adding uh, damages uh, to some of the violations. Then you had uh, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which is basically saying you can't pull DNA up because, and choose not to uh, choose, uh, fire hire or fire someone because of that. And then you had the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, all right? Again, fair pay is basically saying that with the same job and everything, uh, you do not 
discriminate against someone. You must be paid equally. Now, on the federal level, there's also executive orders. Now, the president will issue executive orders. This applies to any company that is doing business with the federal government. That's where executive orders come into play. So you have various executive orders, which kind of uh, mirror the other acts that apply to all other businesses. You have the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, who is responsible for enforcing all of the EEO laws. And so what they'll do is they will investigate and gather information uh, as far as what is it that companies are doing as far as their equal employment. You can see the types of charges that have been filed with the EEOC where people are saying, okay, I've been discriminated against because of retaliation. I had said something or I did something or I was a, um, a, minor a minority and they retaliated against me. You have race and disability and sex, at which are the big ones as far as what kind of charges have been filed with the EEOC. The OFCCP, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance, is kind of the EEOC for the federal government. So companies that are doing business with the federal government are kind of um, have, the, have to deal with the OFCCP instead of the uh, EEOC. Now, one of the things, there are several things that businesses need to do as far as providing an equal employment opportunity for folks. First of all is that whole idea of disparate treatment. Disparate treatment is basically saying treating people differently because of their race, color, religion, sex, and things like that. You have disparate impact. In other words, you think you're doing things right. However, because of what's happening, you even though you feel as if you were innocent, there was an impact that was treating people differently. The way they kind of figure that out is with what's called the four-fifths rule. Let's say that you have an organization and about half of the employees are uh, of the majority and half of the employees are minority. You hire a bunch of folks. You hired 10 of the majority and only one of the minority. That could be considered a disparate impact that was going in there. Then you have what's called bona fide occupational qualifications, BFOQs. BFOQs are basically saying it's okay to discriminate against someone based on one of these, um, based on one of these illegal areas, if they cannot do the job because of this particular thing. So, for example, you may have a BFOQ, a bona fide occupational qualification, of being able to lift fifty pounds. If you can't lift 50 pounds, you cannot, you don't have to be hired, no matter what your race, color, religion, sex, national origin is. So there is a bona fide occupational qualification. You cannot do the job unless you can do this thing. BFOQ one is airline pilots must retire by the age of 65. That is considered a BFOQ. Some people say it's age discrimination. No, statistics have said that at age, by age 65, your reflexes have slowed and various other things. And so for the safety of those who are of the flying public, it's required that airline pilots retire at 65. One of the things to think about is providing what's called reasonable accommodation. So let's say that you have somebody who's in a wheelchair, reasonable accommodations, say the person, and, and you have them uh, uh, doing a job where they're programming computers, they're doing programming. Reasonable accommodation would make sure that they have their work site set up so that they can get their uh, wheelchair in adequately and they have access to that. Unreasonable accommodation would be something like uh, somebody says, well, you know, for my wheelchair, I'd like to have a dedicated uh, elevator up to my uh, workspace. Well, that's unreasonable. They don't have to do that. However, reasonable accommodation is saying, yeah, you can make some basic changes to accommodate someone to be able to do the job. So for example, making various facilities accessible, uh, thinking about modifying some of the, the equipment that they may have, or providing uh, readers or interpreters that will help folks who may be have some sort of disability, and that, but they can do the job with a reasonable accommodation. Another thing to think about is sexual harassment. Sexual harassment basically comes in two flavors. You have quid pro quo, 
and you have hostile environment. Quid pro quo is this for that. Hostile environment is where you're setting up an environment where it makes it difficult for someone to do their job. And so one of the things you want to do is make sure that you're setting it up so that it does not happen as far as sexual harassment is concerned. Nobody deserves to be harassed based on their uh, sex or any of those things. You can prevent it by communicating the policy that forbids it, training people to recognize it, and then making sure that people have an opportunity and a way to go ahead and uh, complain and be protected for it. Then you have OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which basically says that we want people to be safe in their work. And so OSHA is sets up inspections, has standards, and then levies fines for any kind of violations. Companies have a general duty to set up a place that is free from recognized hazards. Now, there are going to be some jobs that are very, very hazardous anyway. So let's say that you're walking iron, uh, you are building buildings, and you're on the uh, the uh, story, way, story, many stories up as far as walking some of the uh, the building and everything. That's that is very dangerous. The thing is, there's no way they can eliminate all all hazards on that. And so there's you have to be uh, cognizant as far as what can we do to help keep people as safe as possible. If you're an employee, when it comes to OSHA, you have the right to request an inspection, and have somebody there representing you for that inspection. So, for example, um, maybe you're part of a union. You can have your union rep there as a part of that. Uh, employees have the right to have dangerous substances identified. So maybe you're working around uh, various acids or something along those lines. They need to be identified and labeled as far as danger is concerned. Informed about any kind of exposure to hazards. So let's say that there was some kind of a, a leak of some sort. You have the right to be exposed, uh, to be informed about that. And then having any kind of violations posted so that people know here are some of the issues that we're running into. OSHA will go into business as many times what they'll do is go in unannounced and they will do an inspection unannounced. They don't have to notify employers that they're going to be doing that. The whole idea behind it is let's make sure people are as safe as possible. The major workplace injuries come from overexertion. In other words, uh, lifting, pushing, things like that and falls are the main thing. So overexertion and falls tend to be the highest uh, uh, instances of workplace injuries. One of the things that companies companies can do various things as far as um, as far as making sure that they're being making things as safe as possible. There's the job hazard analysis technique where you break down the job into the various steps and what kind of hazards are there with each of those steps. And what what companies need to do is reinforce safe uh, safe practices. Uh, what you want to make sure that you have a safety program installed and you're doing everything you can to keep people safe. So, for example, maybe having weekly uh, safety meetings as far as here's some of the things that's going on. Here's some things to think about as far as safety is concerned. And when you start talking about promoting safety internationally, we're becoming a much more global uh, world and companies are doing more and more business overseas. Many times it's difficult to. Um, to make sure that the, the people that you have contracted out work to that are overseas are doing things as safe as possible. For example, uh, most of the clothing that we have here in the United States is not made here in the U.S. For, for example, most t-shirts are made in Bangladesh. Well, Bangladesh has laws and a culture that's nowhere close to what we have here in the United States. And there have been multiple issues as far as fires, buildings collapsing, things like that because they just don't have the laws and things. So we have to be very conscious as far as what it is we're doing to promote safety internationally. So as far as a summary for the chapter, okay, we have the three branches of the federal government that actually get involved with human resource management. We have the various laws that go along with this as far as civil rights acts, vocational rehab acts, um, executive orders, so just be familiar with the various key laws that go along with human resources, man, human resource management. You also have OSHA, you have EEOC, you have o, uh, OFCCP, 
be thinking about avoiding discrimination and disparate impacts. Affirmative action is something where you are making sure that you're trying to correct past discrimination, but not with quotas, because many times quotas become very discriminatory in themselves. And you can prevent sexual harassment very easily by just making sure that people understand this will not be done here. You will be fired if, the, if it happens. And under OSHA, employers have a general duty to make sure that you're doing everything you can to keep people safe. Well, that's it for this chapter. If you have questions, please give me a shout.